Um, but I'd like to start with this sheet that's coming around now from Corey because I think it does a nice job of helping us see a little bit of how important the true doctrine is and how corrosive false doctrine is. Jude spends his whole letter uh, targeting false teachers and their false teaching. Uh, this is something that Christ did in his ministry. It's something that the apostles do in their writings. And it's something that the church fathers did, and certainly in the Lutheran Reformation, read the um, Book of Concord, and you see the positive teaching, the pure doctrine, put forward. But also, there are times when it has to be made quite clear the other side that is actually to be rejected. Uh, and so this is something that we find in the prophets, we find in Jesus' ministry, the apostles, and certainly in the Lutheran church as well. So the person on the top here is a guy named St. John Chrysostom. That's a nickname for him. It means golden mouth. And uh, he was an excellent preacher uh, starting in Antioch in Syria. That was a, the home congregation of Paul, by the way. So remember, Paul was Saul and on his way to Damascus in Syria when he was uh, confronted by the risen Lord, then converted, baptized, immediately takes up his office, which is an uh, apostle, preacher, teacher, and he's doing it in the synagogues there in Damascus. Uh, but he spends most of his ministry at the congregation in Antioch. So he's listed with all these other teachers there. Uh, and that's the congregation that sends him out as a missionary. So he doesn't just kind of go on his own. Uh, the congregation there is the one who sends him, supports him, and hears back from him the report of the work that God accomplished. And I always love that part there in the book of Acts, how the apostles, whenever they report back, it's always what God accomplished. Okay? So they're not saying we did it, but they're saying God did through his word. And this sermon here is... A classic. That's why I wanted it in front of you. This sermon here by John Chrysostom, probably preached in the late 390s. He died in 407. Uh, so he went from Antioch. He was made uh, the archbishop, basically, of Constantinople, which was the capital city, which is probably the most powerful uh, church office at that time, apart from the uh, archbishop of Rome. But this sermon here is one that is basically in the history of Christianity number one as far as Easter sermons go. Uh, Luther has a sermon that's number one as far as the descent into hell goes. In fact, the Lutheran Confessions quote that sermon and refer to that sermon basically saying, if you want to know what the Lutheran Church believes about Christ descending into hell, read Luther's Torgal sermon, I think it's 1533. So that is binding. This sermon here is fantastic, and I am going to read it. It's going to get us ready for the rest of our class today, looking at Jude. If any man be devout and love God, let him enjoy this fair and radiant triumphal feast. If any man be a wise servant, let him, rejoicing, enter into the joy of his Lord. If any have labored long in fasting, so coming off the season of Lent, if any have labored long in fasting, let him now receive his recompense. If any have wrought from the first hour, let him today receive his just reward. If any have come at the third hour, let him with thankfulness keep the feast. If any have arrived at the sixth hour, let him have no misgivings, because he shall in no wise be deprived thereof. If any have delayed until the ninth hour, let him draw near, fearing nothing. If any have tarried, even until the eleventh hour, let him also be not alarmed at his tardiness. For the Lord, who is jealous of his honor, will accept the last, even as the first. He gives rest unto him who comes at the eleventh hour, even as unto him who has wrought from the first hour. And he shows mercy upon the last, and cares for the first. And to the one he gives, and upon the other he bestows gifts." And he both accepts the deeds and welcomes the intention, and honors the acts and praises the offering. 
Wherefore, enter you all into the joy of your Lord and receive your reward, both the first and likewise the second. You rich and poor together, hold high festival. You sober and you heedless, honor the day. Rejoice today, both you who have fasted and you who have disregarded the fast. The table, the altar, Lord's Supper, is full laden. Feast ye all sumptuously. The calf is fatted, let no one go hungry away. Enjoy ye all the feast of faith. Receive ye all the riches of loving kindness. Let no one bewail his poverty, for the universal kingdom has been revealed. Let no one weep for his iniquities, for pardon has shone forth from the grave. Let no one fear death, for the Savior's death has set us free. He that was held prisoner of it has annihilated it. By descending into hell, he made hell captive. He embittered it when it tasted of his flesh. Just pause there. So that's going to be the major kind of image that he then just comes to the end climax with this sense of hell was embittered. Death was embittered. So it, it tasted something it had never tasted before. It thought it had a very tasty morsel. And it bit down. And then it found this food, this man, his death, undoes it, destroys it, annihilates it. Okay, so it embittered death. Christ's death did because he rose from the dead. Uh, and also, that last paragraph which we get to, this embittering, um, the people would kind of, it became like a refrain, and so the people would kind of shout it out there in the cathedral, and then Chrysostom would continue forward um, as far as, well, what does this mean for us, for you? So, uh, middle of that uh, second to last paragraph, by descending into hell, he made hell captive. He embittered it when it tasted of his flesh. And Isaiah, foretelling this, did cry. Hell said, he was embittered when it encountered thee in the lower regions. It was embittered, for it was abolished. It was embittered, for it was mocked. It was embittered, for it was slain. It was embittered, for it was overthrown. It was embittered, for it was fettered in chains. It took a body and met God face to face. It took earth and encountered heaven. It took that which was seen and fell upon the unseen. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, hell, where is your victory? Christ is risen, and you are overthrown, and all the people. Christ is risen, and the demons are fallen. All the people, Christ is risen, and the angels rejoice. Christ is risen, and life reigns. Christ is risen, and not one dead remains in the grave. For Christ, being risen from the dead, has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. To him be glory and dominion unto ages of ages. Amen. Now contrast that sermon with the fun little quote from our, one of the senators from Georgia, our Reverend Raphael Warnock, recently elected to the U.S. Senate. He is a pastor at the church where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had once served, which is indeed quite an honor. But I told my catechism students this week that this quote, I shared it with them, this is false doctrine. This is antichrist. That's how serious these words are. The meaning of Easter is more transcendent than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Whether you are a Christian or not, through a commitment to helping others, we are able to save ourselves. That is a lie. That is false doctrine. He is a false teacher. Now, if I was a resident of Georgia, you know, I would acknowledge his office as a senator. He's been elected to that. Um, but that right there, I hope members of his own congregation are talking to him. He needs to be talked to, or someone in leadership in that church body needs to talk to him because he needs to be talked to. Okay? Chrysostom is in the right. There is a minister of the word. He is a false prophet, a false teacher, and he needs to be uh, held accountable. If not now, he will be. He will be. That's what Jude is getting at in this whole letter. Christ will deal with all false teachers, and that is meant to warn them, but it's also meant to comfort the poor flock, okay? that it will not always be this way. 
and the flock and Luther, the Lutheran church, uh, it's a very critical part of our life from the beginning in the Lutheran church. The lay people must know their doctrine and the scriptures and the catechism uh, because they need to be, as the hearers of the word, uh, they do indeed have the right to hold their preachers accountable. Okay? And they do indeed have the right to call their ministers. Uh, so Luther fought for that, Walter fought for that here in this country, and it all belongs together. The sheep who hear the word must judge the doctrine. They can't just sit there passively. And that's true not just congregationally, but you know, on a larger scale as well. Uh, pastors need to be uh, holding one another accountable as well. Uh, yeah, I think he was, uh, lots of people jumped all over him. Uh, he took the tweet down after a day. He did. Yeah, uh, but, you know, as a graduate of Union Theological Seminary, I'm sure he does believe this. Right. I mean, obviously he does, even though he took down the tweet right. in response to the uproar. Right, and Union, you know, that's, um, you know, very theology department there is actually more just kind of secularism uh, with a veneer of kind of biblical or theological uh, arguments. But the interesting thing is that that's precisely the very thing that appeals. Okay, so it's not something to be taken lightly, that secularistic type of theology, um, because that's the very thing that appeals, that's the basis for social kind of justice um, and the calls for that. So thank you, Mark, for that, that update. That is important to acknowledge that he did take that down, that there was, you know, some pushback on that. Um, yes, wouldn't you say that most Christian churches Yeah, I mean, it, it um, probably, yeah. I mean, you look at all the different sects, and they all have. It, and notice how these Even two. the Catholic Church. Right, yeah, these two things, the resurrection of Christ and the gospel. I mean, notice how he gets both of these wrong, because they belong together. So uh, his resurrection is not about a man in history who rose from the dead after three days, just like he said he would, okay, um, to change, to make everything new. Nothing's the same anymore, at least according to the preaching of the gospel. That's where you find the newness. Uh, not in social action, but in what you hear that he's done. Uh, so again, and then with the gospel, we can't save ourselves. That is a flat-out um, horrible statement. Um, it undoes the gospel. It is, it is antichrist. I mean, that is the criterion that the Lutheran confessions use to uh, point out who is the antichrist, the one who denies Christ, not just in what he's done, but also in what that means for us, namely the free gift of the gospel. The antichrist denies both of these. Um, all right, so Christendom, that's the way to go. Uh, let's get to Jude, uh, right before the book of Revelation there. And if you look at that um, first note there, you'll notice that this book could be called Judas. All right? Uh, and I kind of mean to be provocative there. Uh, Judas, uh, because that's what it is in Greek, Judas. Um but it's based on the Old Testament name, Yud, uh, Yahuda, Judah, we know it. So Judah, or Judas, or Jude, is all really referring to, it's the same name. And like that note points out to you, there's um, 44 times in the New Testament, it refers to eight different people. So you do kind of need to keep track of, of who is who. Um, let's just get right into it. In fact, let's read the whole letter. It's short. It has only one chapter. Uh, the whole letter, and then we'll go back and take a look at the different sections. And actually, if you could read with me, uh, if you have the ESV, that's the version we're using, the letter of Jude. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, 
Although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe, and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, served as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet, in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain, and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error, and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud-mouthed boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. 
to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. All right, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, we'll make our way through your notes, kind of break it down into different sections, and we'll make a couple comments uh, along the way at each spot. Uh, just to, as we go along, pay attention to the ways in which Jude likes to use threes. He said that was a little bit of a defining characteristic of his uh, style, uh, that whereas Peter uh, used uh, twos, Jude likes to use threes. By the way, next Sunday, we're going to go back to 2 Peter, the second chapter, and we're going to see that it's, it's like he's read the whole letter of Jude, and has transplanted it now, it's become now the second chapter of his letter, uh, with some alterations and you know, some editing that's occurred. But it's just very interesting. We're going to hear something very similar next week that we're taking up now this week. All right. Uh, so in that introduction, verses 1 through 4, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Uh, the, the way this is worded actually in Greek, it goes like this. Jude, of Jesus Christ, a servant. So, and the only time that that happens also in the New Testament in any other place is in the letter of James. Jude's brother. Full brother. And both of them were half-brothers of Jesus. So they both shared the same mother, uh, but James and his brother here, Jude, of Jesus Christ's servants, um, were, uh, had Joseph as their uh, father, shared him. Um, James was, at least if you're reading the Gospels and the other places in the New Testament where the names of the brothers show up, James is always listed first, so he probably was the eldest after Jesus. And then um, Jude is listed last, so he was probably the youngest. Uh, it is listed fourth, which is interesting because in the Old Testament, Leah, so Jacob's wife Leah, she's the one who started having children after they're married here. And uh, she has Reuben, then she has Simeon, then she has Levi, and the fourth, the final of her sons, is Judah, uh, from which we get Jude, or and Judas in the New Testament. All right. Uh, Psalm 36, you might want to read that uh, maybe during the week as a way to think about David already in the Old Testament is doing what Jude is doing is accomplishing here with his letter in the New Testament, showing how the godly and the ungodly are always kind of found together. And that, that means for the godly that they will have to struggle. Okay? But even in the midst of the battle, the Lord is faithful. So Psalm 36 is an interesting psalm uh, that you might want to uh, consider. Matthew 23, likewise, in the teaching of Jesus, uh, he, during Holy Week, is uh, teaching in the temple courts, and he uh, is talking about the signs of the end, but he also blasts uh, the religious leaders. In fact, he even uses the same word we saw when we read through Jude here. Woe to you, Pharisees and scribes, Jesus said. Jude here addressing the false teachers in his day, woe to you. Basically, if you continue in this teaching and propagating it, uh, you face judgment and condemnation. And the church already now talks that way. So remember John 20, the sermon today, the gospel reading and sermon, the ministry of the word. The word deals with both absolution forgive the sins of repentant sinners, but also retaining the sins of the unrepentant as long as they do not repent. The goal, of course, is for them to come to repentance, but the only way that's going to happen is you don't share the gospel with such a person. They get to hear only law. In fact, it gets sharper and sharper in their ears. And they are not to hear the gospel, and they are to be excluded from the Lord's Supper until they repent. Okay. Then, then 
Yes, they are to receive this. So just as when a sinner who's repentant hears that gospel and hears that absolution and it has every right to believe those words, that this is my standing before God, same thing for an unrepentant person who hears the law threatening and also false teaching. It's, it's kind of like an extension of this here. Uh, false teachers are to be told, uh, your doctrine is, is dead wrong. And you face condemnation unless you turn back to the apostolic word. So that's how they should regard themselves and their teaching. Uh, that it uh, will be judged and will be condemned. Uh, and so the church already speaks that way, but she still has to suffer having these false teachers in her midst, okay, spewing all sorts of stuff. She, she still has to deal with it. She still has to fight. What's the word used here in Jude a couple different times? Contend. It is a fight. Um, and it... Well, we'll leave that alone. So, Jude here is, Of Jesus Christ, a servant, brother of James, to those who are called the beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, that word kept will come up again and again, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Notice the triad there, mercy, peace, love. Uh, for it to be multiplied means they already have it, but what Jude wants for them is to have it more and more. Okay, so may it be multiplied. Um, verse 3. So now he's kind of moving to the middle of his uh, greeting, which is now to set the table for all that will follow. Beloved. You see that word a couple times? That is a very important word. In Greek it is agape toi. Agape is uh, found in there. Uh, so beloved is a passive word. So, to make it active, you have to change it to this, love, God loves you. You are beloved by God. That's a uh, wonderful thing in the Gospels and throughout the New Testament is that there's a lot of these passives that are going on. Uh, and the understood subject is not always, it's not always expressed. So Jude doesn't write beloved by God. He just calls them beloved. But the understood subject is God is the one who's loving. And so beloved uh, with God's agape love, um, he loves you. And he's called you and all these things have unfolded on the basis of his love. And his peace and mercy will be multiplied to you on the basis of this love. But that's a great title, a great name for a Christian, Beloved. Um, and you think of Jesus in the Jordan, okay, being baptized. This is my beloved son. Uh, with him I'm well pleased. Uh, he's my chosen one. So that we share that name. We share that position, that place. Thanks to Christ and thanks to our baptism that these words now also are ours. So verse 3, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation... I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Um, a couple things here. Uh, to contend for the faith once for all delivered. Um, this word, it's actually just one word. And it gets translated in this case as once for all. And later it also gets is found again later, the same word. And it also gets translated there, once for all. I would argue that it should be translated a little differently that time, but this time, the first time, I agree. Once for all. This word has, you know, if you look up the word in the dictionary, you can have number one, the meaning, number two, the meaning, number three, meaning. So there can be like a range, and that's true for this word here. It can refer to once in the past, just kind of somewhat generic. But it can also be once in the past for all, never to occur again. So uh, the book of Hebrews talks about Jesus' sacrifice once for all. 
Okay? It happened one time in the past, and it will never need to be repeated again. It never will be repeated again. Okay? It was the full redemption price paid freely by him once for all. Um, and that's what's uh, happening here. Contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Okay? The body of doctrine... is that it all hangs together, fits together, just like your body, okay? and it is living. Uh, it, the Spirit dwells within the church. Uh, he is our teacher, and he does not lie. And so this body of doctrine is given in the Word of God and cannot be changed. The false teachers, of course, are trying to maybe hide some things and overemphasize other things and uh, operate from out of their own desires, as Jude puts it here, for whatever reason, often selfish reasons. Um, but when God gives his doctrine, it is an entire whole, it fits together, it works together, um, and it is to be uh, defended and actually used, actually taught. Um, there's a distinction here. Sometimes we see the word faith can be two different things. It could be objective, the faith, which it is here, the faith, once for all delivered to the saints. That is the objective body of doctrine uh, that exists, that's a recognizably biblical Christian. Okay? Uh, but faith can also be subjective, uh, believing. So sometimes when you see the word faith, it refers to that gift from God which receives all his mercy and love and forgiveness uh, for Jesus' sake and the gospel, which it hears, um, so to actually believe. So that's more subjective. And both of those belong together. Okay? Um, it, you can't have this without that. And this always is intended to not only create, but guard and protect this. Uh, faith always has an object. Faith in Christ. Faith in the gospel. Faith in uh, my baptism. Faith in the body of doctrine, pure doctrine. Okay. Um, all these belong together. So you can't have this and say this down here doesn't matter. That's not how faith talks. Okay? Faith does not talk that way. Uh, it's not healthy if it is. All right, um, look at verse 4. Now here's where the rubber hits the road. This is the last verse in the greeting. Um, certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for, for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality, and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Uh, we saw this with 2 Peter, uh, where it talked about our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here it's Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Both these titles refer to Him. Uh, so it's not like our only Master, God the Father, and the Lord, Jesus Christ. Um, the grace of God into sensuality. That's kind of the heart of the problem here. Uh, so Luther faced this in the Reformation, and it is a perennial uh, problem uh, for us because of the realities we're dealing with, that the gospel supposedly um, means that you don't need that. Okay? That we just live simply by the gospel. Um, what is the, that major distinction that we as Lutherans, and actually I'll say it this way, only Lutherans have it, in clarity anyway, what's that major distinction that we always are teaching? The distinction, the proper distinction between uh, law and gospel. The Lutheran Confessions say that proper distinction between law and gospel is an especially brilliant light by which the whole scriptures are understood. Okay? When you lose that distinction, that's why there's heresy in the church. I, that's what I always say, is that the reason there's problems in the Roman Catholic Church is that that distinction was not maintained. 
The reason there's problems in the Baptist or Methodist church is because that distinction is not maintained. That's where the problem always starts. And the only way to reform the church and heal the impurity is to get back to this. So it was a problem not just for Luther and the Reformation, but for Jude in this letter. The false teachers were um, trying to remove the law. Okay, so they're changing the grace of God into sensuality, which is lawlessness, really. Um, and what we see then is that when this distinction gets weakened, things start to kind of elide, and the law no longer is the law, the gospel is no longer the gospel. And really, all you have left, you always will have left, just basically this. The law is, is what remains. Okay? Um, that's what you're left with. And you can't make that distinction. All right, verse 5. Um, as you see here, um, Jude is going to, uh, in a couple different sections here, go back to the Old Testament and um, draw on it to confront the false teachers today. So he'll have um, an example from the Old Testament, might take a verse or two, and then he'll close it out with application to the false teachers today. So we'll, let's do that with the first section here, starting in verse 5. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Uh, what's interesting about that verse? Yeah, Jesus saved them. I mean, that's that's what um, the that's the key to the apostolic uh, preaching and the uh, writings of the New Testament that they understand that uh, Christ uh, Jesus is the one who's speaking and acting in the Old Testament. Okay. So Jude. Uh, does something wonderful here is he just makes it extremely explicit. Okay? Something that everyone else is saying and using. Paul does it, and the book of Hebrews does it big time. But what Jude does is he just kind of uses the, the name of his half-brother, uh, and, and that really just sticks out like a sore thumb. Okay? But it is the truth. Right? So Jesus saved them out of Egypt, but those very people did not contend for the faith. They didn't hang on to the, the words and promises of God. They rebelled. And so he brought judgment already to them during their earthly life. You will not enter my rest. Psalm 95. Uh, and book of Hebrews. So they were punished for that rebellion. And Jesus, the very one who rescued them out of Egypt, is also the one who brought judgment against them. Now, the thing always to bear in mind with that generation, the Bible uses them, Psalms, Hebrews, other places in the New Testament, as the prototypical generation for us to bear in mind that their rebellion needs to inform our carefulness in living the Christian life today. And the thing to bear in mind is that though they were punished, they did not enter the Promised Land, they would have been given opportunity to repent so that even though they die in the wilderness, outside the promised land, if they've repented, trusted God's mercy, the one who delivered them out of Egypt, trusting his mercy, they would be brought to heaven after their death. So they would not enter the land. They still endured that punishment. But that doesn't mean that they aren't uh, saved. Um, so let's keep going here. Verse 6. The second example here. First is Jesus bringing them out of Egypt, but then destroying those who did not believe. Verse 6. The angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. And now the third example. Here we go with threes. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, Serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So those verses are all here, the three examples. One, two, three. And then now applying it to the false teachers. 
Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. So angels, uh, basically. So uh, again, the three, the triad there. Um, one thing I did want to just highlight uh, quickly about Sodom and Gomorrah, we see it here and we see it in Genesis, the Old Testament, uh, that it's not just the cities, S and G, but it's also the villages around them. Okay? Lot prays for a little village named Zoar, And they flee to Zoar, and that's not destroyed. But Sodom and Gomorrah and the little towns around got destroyed. And the reason I want to bring that up is this issue here of sensuality, uh, sexual licentiousness, uh, which the false teachers were promoting uh, as a way to, in, in a sense, um, give people what they want to hear. Okay? Attract them to, to me, the person as their teacher. I'm the one you can rely on. Okay? That's what that was the dynamic that was going on. But notice how also those that are around it, it's like collateral damage. Okay? That's why uh, in the uh, epistles of the New Testament, the apostles all are, uh, make it clear, not only do you, you, you must deal with false teachers and false teaching, because what that what happens is it uh, defiles the whole congregation. Okay? We don't think that way. We think everybody has their own problems, their own issue, and it can't really um, kind of morph out and spread. It's not catchy. Okay? I mean, we talk about that socially. That is one of the biggest issues when we're talking about some of the social issues. So like, let's say, gay marriage. That doesn't impact me and my marriage. That's the, the false thought there, because it does. Okay? Um, it, never, uh, it never can just be kind of confined. Okay? Um, it's always spreading. Okay? Um, I guess I was reading here about some of these laws that are you know, they're trying to put into effect regarding transgenderism. And the article was putting it this way that, you know, uh, suicidal thought, you know, suicidal thoughts are um, very, very high within the homosexual community, and they are even higher among transgender people struggling with that issue. And the way the article presented it was almost like, so therefore, we need to make sure that insurance covers any and every um, uh, transgender uh, medical um, procedure, medication, um, surgery, also of children okay, under the age of 18. That's part of the problem that we're seeing developing is that parents also are completely losing their authority here. Okay? And we're seeing that children, it's becoming kind of a... a my friend does it, and so then that kind of pulls me over in that direction. Now it becomes a popular thing to do, okay? And so now I'm going to do it. But the, the argument against that is, well, they're not old enough yet. That doesn't count. The law is still getting rammed right on through. The agenda is getting rammed right on through. But let's step back. I mean, isn't that the very issue? We're not letting children be children where the adults in their life are responsible and are teaching them and are helping them and are with them through the pain. Okay. We'll not abandon them. Okay. Uh, and uh, that they literally are not able to make these kinds of decisions. And what if the response to this kind of epidemic of uh, suicidal thoughts within the homosexual community, within the transgender community, what if the problem is the thing itself? What if that is the source of this for them? And that there's a, there's a different way, there's a better way. And your whole life is preaching it to you. 
because every, certainly every human being exists thanks to that heterosexual relationship of the father and the mother. Um, there would, and that's true in every case. I mean, you want to talk about the science, there's not many things where literally every single time that absolutely is always the case without any exception. Okay? Um, and so that should be telling us something. Um, all right, let's go to uh, the next section. How about I'll let you guys take a look. Is there anything that of these sections that is kind of most interesting to you? So the next one, verses 9 and 10, Jude employs the illustration of the archangel Michael. There you see the two places. Deuteronomy 34 is Moses' death. Zechariah 3 is very intriguing. Uh, there's a high, Jewish high priest named Joshua, and he's... Zechariah uh, is writing about him, and he's clothed in his priestly garments, but they're all dirty. And on his right is the archangel Michael, and on the other side is uh, the devil, Satan, the accuser. And Satan is basically, you know, saying to Joshua, the high priest, you know, uh, you know, you're worthless, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Michael, the archangel, basically steps in. And he says, "The Lord rebuke you." So even though Michael, the archangel, has great power, great authority, he leaves it to God. But these false teachers have no real authority, and yet they speak in these you know, wild ways. Uh, they kind of are loud mouth boasters, he said in another place. Even Michael doesn't talk that way. He says, the Lord rebuke you. Um, the next one, uh, 11 through 13, Cain, Balaam, Korah. You remember Korah, he wanted to uh, replace Aaron, the high priest. And, um, you know, all God's people are priests. And um, Moses says, okay, fine, burn your incense. And everybody come to out and burn your incense and we'll see who the Lord accepts. And Korah and it's about like 250 of his followers, the earth opens up and swallows them whole alive as judgment against this rebellion against Moses, against Aaron, and ultimately against the Lord. Uh, but the, the false teachers that Jude is dealing with, uh, they're not af afraid of judgment. They say there will be no judgment. There's no such thing. Okay? That's the big, the big issue. There's no judgment. There's no definite pl plan and will of God for human life. There will be no last day. The world just keeps going. It keeps going on its own. Okay. He'll not come back. That's what they're saying. Um, First Enoch, uh, there, verses 14 to 16, that was a Jewish writing between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, the first chapter is uh, a very strong, powerful, um, and Jude quotes from this non-biblical source, uh, but brings it forward, and uh, then applies it to the false teachers. Again, we see that Old Testament and then application. And then the final one is the warning from the apostles. Um, and I do want to point out, I put all those verses in the parentheses. This is a very important thing in the New Testament where when we talk about the end of time, we don't just mean the last day and the uh, days immediately leading up to it. We mean everything from the death and resurrection of Christ until his second coming. So we are living right now in the last days. And Peter preaches that on Pentecost. That's the Acts chapter 2. The uh, book of Hebrews starts off that way. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Um, so all those verses there show us how the New Testament talks that the end times are this whole thing. We are in the last days. It's not something in the future. It's right now. Okay? And we're looking forward. And again, he will return. That's part of the apostolic teaching. It's part of the creed, isn't it? He will come to judge the living and the dead. 
the false teachers that Jude is uh, contending with, they would not say that. They'd say the opposite. They could not confess the Apostles' Creed. That's one of the ways that shows, okay, unmasks, uh, that they are indeed false teachers. They can't teach something that is uh, very prominent, that is part of the uh, New Testament. All right, um, let's uh, end there. We'll conclude with the benediction, or with uh, the college for the week. And maybe just keep these, because next week we're looking at 2 Peter 2, which is basically like Jude. And then the following week, we're going to kind of compare and take a look at both of them together. So we might be able to just touch back on Jude here a little bit uh, on that occasion. Well, I've been remiss. The Lord is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Hallelujah. Let us pray. O oh God, grant that we who have celebrated the resurrection of our Lord may uh, indeed in our life and conversation confess him to be Lord and God, through the same Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.